Christ. Man, that's missing so much. I, I become uh, seemingly I'm confronted with that a lot and uh, in myself and uh, unfortunately in others too. Uh, but mostly in me. Uh, I was thinking over there, you know, I used to I used to get, I used to almost covet uh, opportunities to speak after that, wanted that. And now I re- just try to repel against or rep- <laughs> all, all of it because, you know, used to, I, I did, I, and I, I think it's because, I think as you at least grow in, in somewhat of growing the seeing of Christ, I think at that point in time when I really wanted to be a speaker and whatever, uh, I was too ignorant to know how ignorant I was. And I think now I realize how ignorant I am. And I also, when I stand here or I sit in front of someone or any of it, and it's becoming more and more, not less and less with me, I feel the gravity of it, the weight of it. There's a responsibility to that. What Jimmy did, there's a responsibility to this. Um, and I don't take it lightly, and um, I don't think any of us take it lightly, but in my heart it's been more of a, a real, the gravity of the thing comes before you, and you realize I'm dependent on the Spirit of God here to even have syllables to utter that are worthy of his body. And... Uh, so I just pray this morning and every day that the Lord gives utterance and, and shares his heart. Um, I want to deal with, and you see on the board we'll get to that, but uh, something I've, I've been looking at for a good while now, and I have shared it to some degree in some classes previous, about the... Uh, the security of the believer, the security of the soul. And, and we can just say it this way, that the security of the believer is the security of Christ in the believer. Um, as secure as he is in the Father, we are in him. Now, someone asked, uh, I recently read, about the uncondition, unconditional side of that and they say well is it unconditional well no it's not unconditional abide in me as I abide in you that's the condition if any man be in Christ that's the condition so it's not unconditional his love is not to all it's to one And it's to all if they have that one in them. And that keeps just going over and over. I mean, if these were just teaching sessions and and just classes for me and just studies that I'm on, then I would say, ah, I need something new. I've said these things. But it's new. It's truth. It's real. It's, It's a reality that we have to understand because so many... I. In my heart, and I've said to others, and and this, because here's the danger. Here's the necessity. Here's the need. Look at your, look at his face only. Seek his face only. And do not seek his reflection in your own face. There's a difference. And that's the danger. Most people want the reflection in their own face, and they yet haven't seen his. So we're looking for a result, and we haven't even faced the cause yet. We get the one before the other because we want what we can see. We don't want what we can't. We don't go after and allow the Spirit of God to take us on to something. It's the transition. It's the the real problem. And this is the part of sanctification. This is what sanctification is all about. This is what growing in grace, this is what growing in the Lord is all about. It's the transition of the soul from the seen to the unseen. 
from the natural to the spiritual, from the first to the second, from me to Christ. It's that transition to where the whole problem is. That's where the, that's where, and, and that's the whole thing that the Spirit of God exerts His energy toward, is that transition. And the, now the transitions happened in matter of fact. But in my soul's comprehension, I can still be ignorant and fight against that transition. And there is a rebelling because there is an exclusivity to this thing that offends man to no end. There is a singleness to this that offends us. And it's what Paul calls the offense of the cross. And it is an offense to the natural man. And it never will cease being an offense to the natural man. And and I told a guy recently who emailed me questioning things about myself personally. And I said, pray for me because there are things in my heart. There are places of darkness in my soul where the light of Christ's face and his appearing has not penetrated yet and the and the judgment of that appearing has not taken place yet and I covet your prayers for that because I pray for that I can't say brother I know it because I have to be confronted with the verses if any man thinks he knows anything he doesn't know anything yet as he ought to know If any man thinks himself something, being nothing, he's deceived himself. And I see that. (laughs) That's always before me. And I realize the need is to see Christ. Not to see me like him or to see a reflection of him in me. It's to see him. And the other happens. The other is automatic. It takes place. But that's not the focus. And it can't be the focus. And as long as it is the focus, we won't see him. To those who look for him, he shall appear. Now when that's the single view, then that's the single motivation of our heart, he appears. But when it's not, then he doesn't. I mean, as simple as that. It's where your heart is. It's about your heart. So, this this, uh, study has been on that because... As long as I'm in the picture, to any degree, in my heart, in my, uh, in my comprehension of God, it's kind of like in the garden, after they ate, their view of themselves, because of their eating the tree, their view of themselves began to define God's view of them. They began to define God's view of them by their view of them, naked and all of these things. And we do the same thing. But God's view of us is totally other than us. And that's what offends people because it takes it out of me, period, good or bad. Takes it out of me and puts it right into the face in the presence and person of another. And that offends me. It offended me when I first began to see that. Because I'm like, what do you mean? All this work I've done is worthless? No. No. The work you've done has not been worth it. The Lord's not, not going to uh, deny that. I was looking here. I mean, I think it goes along. Uh, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name. He's not, he's not that mean. I mean, <laughs> which you have showed in his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we have ministered. And, and mo- some of us, me included, have ministered in ignorance. But God still understands the heart and and your motive may be pure but your your understanding is not so here's what paul says after all that so we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of expectation to the end and be not slothful but followers of them who through faith and patience are now inheriting the promises In other words, that you allow God to bring you on, because that's what chapter 6 is all about, bringing us on unto perfection. And don't be slothful in your soul's pursuit of that which is perfect and back away and say, no, no, I'm I'm fine. I I like where I am. No, (laughs) that's where you are is where you're supposed to be. But what you comprehend of where you are is not. It's about the soul living in the understanding of the, or or say it the way Paul says it, by faith accessing the grace wherein we presently stand. So, I'm I'm, I'm getting around here. But, uh, 
uh, we're, we're looking at the security of the believer. But again, the security of the believer has to be seen outside of the believer. Outside of the context of the believer. Because as long as I'm still in the picture, there's no security. As long as I'm still in the picture, there's no anchor for the soul. So let's, we'll, we'll look at these things. Galat- we talked about Galatians 4 before where it says that the surety or seal of your sonship, remember, is the fact that God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Basically doing in you what you couldn't do. Bringing a relationship into your soul that you had no hope of except he dwell in it. And he brings that relationship. My father and I will come and we will dwell in you. That's what he says. Well, this is the fulfillment of that. The spirit of the son, the spirit of adoption, coming into your heart and having a relationship with his father in us. The question is, is my soul aware of the relationship that's going on? Or am I attempting to establish one of my own? Or have God have one with me, separate from the one he already possesses? Because God will not... uh, Separate himself from his eternal fellowship with his son so he can have one with you or with me. The grace is he's brought us into the eternal, fixed, unbreakable fellowship that he's always had. That's the beauty of the whole thing. That's why the the exclusivity and singleness of this thing is so profoundly secure. Because I'm not the object of the thing, therefore it is absolutely secure. Eternal security is defined there. Not men can do whatever they want, be whatever. No, that's not it. It's about Christ being who he is in me. And that's the security of it. He is the ever-living, ever beloved Son of the Father. Guess what? He's that in me. And therein, my relationship with God is secure. As long as my soul is set to know that Son, and I'm abiding in that union that the Father has provided. That's the grace. Now, So we we dealt with that. And then he goes on in Galatians 4 and he talks about after you have known God and then he backs up and makes what I think is a real divine correction. Rather known of God. Not your knowing of God but God's knowing of you. He puts the weight of everything on God's knowing of us. Our knowing of God is for our benefit so that we can participate in God's knowing of us. But the true security of the thing The weight of it is upon the fact he is knowing us in Christ. Now we can't get off into that. And we know 1 Corinthians 13, knowing even as we are known. And that's where the Spirit of God exerts his energy in our hearts. That we may know even as or according to the knowing that God has. Uh, Apprehending as we are apprehended of God. Really the same thing being said there. Then we went to uh, 2, Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to speed through this here so we can get somewhere. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, dealing with the seal of the foundation. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the stuff before that about the resurrection past already. We've dealt with that. Uh, verse 19, nevertheless... Regardless of the overthrowing of some faith and the, and the declaration of false doctrine and all of those things. Nevertheless, there's something sure here. There's something secure, unbreakable, unshakable. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal or signet on it. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is not doing bad things. The iniquity is me. Iniquity is me. And everything that comes with that. All right, so I, I was drawing on the board, and this I, I drew this on the board, but if I can draw over here just a second. 
most people think, and here's the way most people think of our salvation, and it is true to a degree, but I want to show us, what I want us to at least go away with today is, an, is, a, is just being able to see how singular God's view is and how secure his view is. And not only that, but we're going to also get into the, the reaction of man with, in view of that singleness. We're, we'll get to that too. But here's how most people see our salvation. They see, if, if they even see it this, you see the Father and the Son, and then what they've done is say, well, our salvation is that we have been brought up here into the Father and the Son. And so we have this relationship. And that's true to a degree. But see, we still see this up here. So we think what this means is Bobby, Billy, Johnny, and Jimmy have their own little relationship with the Father and the Son here in the heavenly places. Okay. That's not true. There is no, and I, and I know I need to explain this, but I don't have time. There are no personal independent, individualized relationships with God. Everything of that eternal relationship must become personal in me. It must become, my soul must possess it personally. But it's not an individualized relationship God has with Raven. Because then Raven is the thing that has to keep it going. And see, there's so much to that. And these, the, I mean, this is 40 classes that can be put here. But the truth of this is this. He comes and brings in to me that eternal relationship. This is, uh, I wrote here, this is what he says, no man comes to the Father but by me. There's the me. Right here. It's not, I'm the only one that can drag you up here so you can have a good relationship with God. No, I'm the only one who can come into you and give you the relationship I have. That's why in Matthew 11, he talks about his relationship. No man knows the Father but the Son, or the Son but the Father, and all of that. And then the next thing, I always thought it was crazy. He changed his mind about what he wanted to say. But it does interact. He first establishes his relationship with God, and then he says, Now, come to me, you who labor, heavy laden. Why are they laboring? To have the relationship with God that he already possesses. We do the same thing. Why? Because we've got this Backwards. We don't realize this is our security. He lives in me. He has made unto me salvation and relationship with God. Like I've said many, many times, you did not have each individual Israelite, which is what's here, with their own Ark of the Covenant or their own altar. They didn't have them in their little tents. There was one, one altar, one Ark of the Covenant, one tabernacle. They had to come here to the one. And not only that, they finally had, it had to be condensed that they come here to one. And we'll get to that in a second because this shows the security of the whole thing. So, uh, to me, this all goes back how he looks at Israel and this is what this has to do with Israel is my son this is Exodus 4 22 Exodus is my son even my firstborn now remember to the firstborn there was the promise what double portion the inheritance what was it king priest kingdom priesthood it was a double portion so that's why he says to me, all the firstborn, all the firstborn, because there was always that expectation of the firstborn being the one to whom the king, kingship and priesthood belonged. Well, we know that come to be fulfilled in Christ. Well, so does this. My son, my firstborn. So now in that declaration, God is defining or, 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 or explaining really sharing his view and his determination to bring Israel into a particular relationship with himself. What is that? My son. 
He doesn't see this. He doesn't, well, he sees this. But he doesn't see 20 million Israelites and say, I've got a relationship with them. I have a covenant with them. Israel is my son. We can never forget that. Everything comes to that. Everything stems from that. Every dealing God ever dealt with Israel was about that. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So in Romans 8, 29, he is called the firstborn among many brethren. In the Greek there, it's not among as if he's one among many. In the Greek, it's in. He's the firstborn in. See what we just, uh, well, I erased it, but the firstborn in many brethren. That's Israel. The firstborn in many. The firstborn in many. Brethren. How could they be called Israel? There's one in them. And that had to be the case. This would have been the case regardless. This had to be the case. Priest and king had to happen. One in many. Now, uh, so we have... and I know I'm, I'm going fast, but uh, Hebrews 7.26, For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, because it all does come to be brought into the high priest. We'll get to that. Such a high priest, holy. Listen to him describe. Listen to the high priest describe. And then realize why our salvation is so secure. It was fitting. That we should have such a high priest, holy and blameless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Who's that? Me. Separate from sinners. Other than sinners. Other than me. It was fitting that someone other than me should stand before God accepted. Why? Because I couldn't. You couldn't. And why do we have this audacious discovery seemingly through religion that we finally can get to a point where we can? Just because we read some scriptures and do what they say. Paul did that too. And he realized, I'm still a wretched man. I have to be delivered from the body of this death. Not I got to do it better. No, I've done it the best I can and I'm still not him. I'm not even like him. Hebrews 7, 26 again. Separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens. I said, I wrote here, this verse should fill our hearts with a a perfect surety of our state of being. It should make us cry out in an unencumbered uh, uh, attitude, rejoicing, gratitude, as did Paul, to the glory of his grace wherein we are accepted in the beloved. That should be our rejoicing. In the security of the thing. Because we have such a high priest. Who is other. Than we are. This is as Roman says. The grace wherein we presently stand. However the real need. At the end toward which the spirit works. Is that we would access and live. In the sure ground of that grace. By faith. What is faith? Faith is seeing his face and not mine in a very condensed definition. Faith is seeing him. Faith is beholding his face and not our own. Seeing him as the substance and not ourselves. Seeing him as the evidence of reality and not ourselves. Paul, Paul explains the high priest who was fitting and necessary for us. And he further emphasizes this by going into verse 22. So much so was Jesus made the surety of guarantee, or guaranteed or sureness of the better covenant. We'll read some verses here. So if we go on, Israel is my son, my firstborn. We observe that, and we must understand that before before the face of Israel, in, in the creating of this, God condenses, even does it with the firstborn. And if you read it, he does it with the firstborn. It, it went from everything, all of that is mine. 
And it finally went down to a certain priesthood, and then it finally went down to the high priest, if you read the order of it. The firstborn comes to be finally condensed, the son, the firstborn, condensed into one man, and that's the high priest who stood in the midst of Israel. Who alone can stand before the Father, accepted and received. I wrote uh, Hebrews 7, uh, 20, 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmities or weaknesses. But the word of the oath which was since the law makes the Son high priest. Makes the Son who is consecrated forever. Uh, it's said in the same thing in, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 5. And again, we're going to read some verses, but... Uh, chapter 4, I mean chapter 5, verse 4 through 6. No man taketh this honor, priesthood, unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of... Well, we'll stop there. Uh, so I, I want to stress to you, because here's, the, here's, here's where we'll go, and, and, and we'll go on. Everything in this encampment shows the exclusivity, the singleness of the Father's view, and the singleness of his relationship to Israel, which would be his relationship with us. Because Israel is my son. See all these names? This is where we get mixed up. All these names. You almost want to say name above every name. Don't you? Anyway, numbers. You know the order, the encampment, the order. Remember when uh, Balak was taking Balaam up to the mountain to curse them? And he looks at them, Balaam looks at them, and God moves upon him and God opens his eyes, basically what he does. Or actually in the Hebrew, it's not opened his eyes as Balak's, Balaam says, it's closed his eyes. He closed his natural eyes to show him the truth. It says, the man whose, God, who, whose eyes God has closed in the Hebrew, not open. And that amazed me when I saw that. Because what he did was he closed his natural vision and showed him the order of Israel and showed him everything that order meant. Because he even said the sound of a or the shout was it the shout of a king is in him, and he says I can't bless I mean, I can't curse this God has blessed this why this is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places this is what the encampment's all about uh, but he sees the order Paul says the same thing in Col in, in Colossians two says beholding your order in the Lord brethren. He rejoiced in them. And then he tells them, so let no vain philosophies of men take you out of this. For in him you are complete. In him you are made full. Now, this is the order he was beholding. He's just beholding the spiritual reality of it. He sees Christ. Now, uh, so let, let's look at the order. Numbers, it, it comes down to what I've got poorly drawn here. But Numbers chapter 2. Uh, there's a lot of verses, but I'm just going to read the first couple of verses that describes all of what I have drawn here. But this shows you, and you'd have to take this too to Isaiah 11:10, I think it is, where he will be the standard or the ensign unto whom all the nations will gather. Christ being being that. Lord spake unto Moses, saying, "Every man of the children of Israel shall pitch his own standard." With the ensign of their father's house. Far, far off about the tabernacle of the congregation shall they pitch. So here's what you have. You have 12 standards or banners. I have it in color here. It makes much more sense when you look at all the here they're all the same color. There they weren't, okay? They were all different colors. Each, 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 each tribe had their, own, had their own banner that was a certain color, and it had a cer certain insignia on it uh, 
describing their father, describing uh, the father's name or their father's tribe. Or you have here Dan and Asher and Nephtali and as all, all the different tribes. And this is, kind of, I think, according to what I read, this is how they were set. Uh, it looks a lot better than this when Daniel does it. Uh, but each of these standards, these are the flags or the standards or the banners that were over them. Remember his banner over us is love. That's the true standard of the church. Uh, anyway, each one of these, now the center ones, however, these center ones were the main standards on the respective sides of the tabernacle. They had 12, but there were four main standards. Okay? Now see, I want you to understand this. Watch it consolidate. Watch it. This is what God does. You go to, go to Revelation, you see the same thing. First he sees a new heaven and a new earth. Then he sees a city. Then he sees one on the throne. It always condenses. Who makes it a new creation? Go to the point. See, he always condenses it. He does that. That's what he's done in salvation and in reality. This is what he does here. So you have 12 standards, and then you have four main standards. And the four main standards I have here somewhere. To the east is Judah. What was their symbol? Everybody should know this. The lion. The lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus, right? That was on their banner, the lion. Reuben was to the south. His was the face of a man. Now these things should become very, should bring up verses when I start saying these things. West was Ephraim. And what was that? That was the ox. North was Dan. That was the main one on the north. And that was the eagle. Now, where's these faces seen again? In Ezekiel. The one who had the appearance of four faces. What did he see? He saw this. But when he consolidates it down again, this is what Ezekiel said. He had the appearance of a man. Four-faced, but the appearance of a man. This has the appearance of a man, too. In fact, in, in when you read uh, Numbers, when Balaam's looking at him, he says, and I behold him. He doesn't say behold them, he says behold him. So, here's the four banners consolidated down. And you see the same thing in Ezekiel. When they're in, what, what's he doing? You see the same thing in Ezekiel because they're in captivity. And God's trying to bring them back to his view. So he's revealing his view. Here it is. That's his view. The appearance of a man. All in one man. He does the same thing in Revelation. One in the midst of the candlesticks. Standing. And if you hear, see the description of the high priest. Daniel's even drawn it before. You see the description of this tabernacle. Feet as of brass. Gold in the center where he's bound the paps. This is all gold. This is all brass. Fire and cloud and smoke and the hair like wool. That's the smoke of the censer from the high priest. It's here. I mean, you see all of that described. Why? Because again, he's trying to bring them back to his view. Now, okay. I say all of that. To come down to this. Because everything of this encampment, the whole of it, even the curtains of every door, come to be defined in one man. When, when you look at the high priest, and it's so beautiful, that the tabernacle and the garments of the high priest, it said this about both in their creation. God gives them the spirit of wisdom to create it. God said, I will have men that I have given the spirit of wisdom make these things. The clothes of Aaron 
and this tabernacle. No wonder he says, may God give unto you spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Why? Because if it took him the spirit of wisdom to create the type, guess what it's going to take to see the reality. So, if you look at the curtains and all of that, you'll see the same fabric of these curtains, same color, same fabric, everything is in the garments of the high priest. The garments of beauty and glory. It's the same colors and same fabric. What's God doing? Well, he created it for a reason. It's a testimony. Showing it, condensing in. He consolidates the whole of the thing into one. And that's what he has to do in my heart. Again, what Jimmy said. Refocus everything on the person. One person. Here's the security of it. And then to further uh, make his point, every color, and this is, I've read many Jewish books on these things and uh, in the Jewish encyclopedias and different things. Every color of these banners corresponded to the colored stone in the high priest's breastplate. There was not... I mean, if it was black here, if this stood for one, this was black. Why? God's consolidating their view down to one. To show them their security. Why is it called the breastplate of judgment? Because that's what it does. It makes a judgment. It judges in my soul. Same judgment God makes in the revealing of His Son now. It is not I, but it's Him who's accepted. It is not me, it is Him who stands before God accepted. Now God never saw, God didn't see this in the Holy of Holies. When He stood in the Holy of Holies, He didn't have this on. Why? God doesn't need this. God just sees Him. Israel had to see that. You see that? Israel had to behold this, not God. God already knew. Uh, we'll read, uh, there's a, uh, where's that verse here? Oh, here it is. This goes into it because, well, I'll read this first and then we'll describe, we'll, we'll explain it. Exodus 28, 36 and 38. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it. Now this is when he's making the, the head plate for the high priest, the mitre. And take this back, what we read a while ago, or at least quoted, I, I think I read it. This foundation of God has a seal or a signet. Because we'll, we'll read that in a minute too. So he's saying, thou shalt make a plated go pure gold and grave upon it like the engraving of a signet. Holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace that it may be upon the mitre, upon the, 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 the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon, listen to this, it shall be upon Aaron's forehead. God did not make one for everybody. I mean, I know that's just simple, but it's true. And we need to at least understand that scripturally. God doesn't make a mitre or a signet, a gold signet, for anyone else but Aaron. That's it. He's the only one that can wear this. It shall be upon Aaron's forehead. So that Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy things. Or he shall serve in this uh, tabernacle. 
which the children, blah, blah, I, I put dot, 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 we skip over. And it shall be always, listen to these words. I want you to listen to this and just realize the security of this thing because this is fulfilled in Christ. This is our salvation, just in testimony. It shall be always upon his forehead so that they may be accepted before the Lord. Did you see that? It shall be upon his head so that they may be accepted. That's security. What was the only thing required of them? Really, they brought everything to him. He was the one that stood before God. What was required on them? The day of atonement, what was required? It's the same thing required of us. Wait. Stand and wait. On, his, on the Father's view to appear. Wait. It was a Sabbath day. No work to be done. It is with us as well. Wait. You don't need to do anything. He's done it all because on that day, this man, this high priest did everything. His hand was on every offering, every sacrifice, everything. The only thing they had to do was stand here at the door and wait for him to come out. For him to show himself as accepted here. And when he came out, he wasn't wearing the linen again. He was wearing this so that they would see the judgment. And they would see the, the one who had the signet upon his head that said, holy unto God. And the judgment was, I'm not, he is. I live only because he lives. I'm accepted only because the one who is in our midst is accepted. There's nothing but security there. That's why Paul, in, in Hebrews 6, where we just read, that's why Paul goes on and he describes what he calls the anchor of the soul. You want to know who he describes it as? This man. The anchor for the soul that reaches into the holiest of all. Who stood there? Only one. That's the anchor of the thing. Israel is my son. That whole picture comes to be defined right here in one man. Not only that, this man is the consolidation of the lamb and the blood on the door in Goshen. He's just a perfect view of it. A greater view of it. I, I don't know if, you're, if I'm making sense, but... The signet upon the forehead of the high priest is the same as the foundation has a seal upon it. It has a signet. It, it, I, I, I wrote here and I was looking at the word seal, signet and seal. And according to the, uh, Dick, this is the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. It says in the literal sense, a seal is an instrument of stone or metal or hard surface. Upon which is engraved some device or figure, an impression or some, on some softer substance as clay. In other words, the stone makes an impression on something. Other object, in, listen to this, it is done for a token of authenticity. The use of sealing, one of the most important uses of sealing in antiquity was to give a proof of authenticity. A, a, allied to this is the formal ratification of a covenant. The proof of authenticity. One head, one seal, one relationship. That's the proof of authenticity. That was the proof and guarantee of relationship with God for these people that were here. They had nothing to do with their standing with God except to be obedient to what he did on that day. 
That's every, every sacrifice they brought during the year was based upon this work he did on the Day of Atonement. They just kept bringing it in light of what he had already accomplished. Because in Christ we have forgiveness of sins. In him we have. But it was all in the basis of he's my acceptance with God. He's my relationship with God. And what I want us to see is how God condenses the whole thing down to one. And secures the whole thing there. So what is, what is, what is required? To wait. To see, to behold his face, to live in a soul, in a pursuit with expectation on his appearing. So that he'll appear in me as the anchor for my soul. Because anything else is not an anchor. Anything else is just this. Up and down, shifting around. There's no security there. There's no anchor there. And I'm jumping over a whole lot of things to get... get to my point because it's amazing to me and it's amazing in me. I see it in me. How I, try, I, I, I continually stand in opposition to the very thing that secures me. Man does that. We continually stand in opposition to the very thing that secures us. Why? Because it's not me that secures it. I want it to be me that secures me. I want to be God's chosen. I want to be the one upon whose head the seal is. I want it. It's as simple as that. You shall be as God has, has rang and echoed in the heart of Adam since the garden. And religion has just amplified it. To a million times, you will be like God. You will be like God. Guess what? God didn't say that. God says, in this one man, I will know you. In this one man. And he does the same thing. And, and we've talked about, uh, I'm running out of time here, but we've talked about Korah and the whole rebellion of Korah. And that is a beautiful description, a sad but beautiful description of us. Of how we stand. And look, here's, here's the whole thing. Aaron is this man. He condensed everything down into Aaron. Aaron will stand with the signet on his head. And then here's these 250 men standing against. It says this. They stood against Moses and Aaron. What were they doing? They were standing against the very relationship God had offered and provided. Why? Because they weren't the substance of that relationship. They didn't like that. They wanted to have something to do with it. They wanted to have some standing before God there. So they say, you, who do you think you are? You take too much on yourself. You try to exalt yourself above the people. And Moses hears that and he falls on his face. And he finally, and here's where they get that in 2 Timothy, what we read. He says, tomorrow morning the Lord will make known. In the Hebrew it says, we'll know those who are his. And the one who will stand before him. And I love this part. It just shows the absurdity of the natural mind. Moses says, go get your censers. All of you, get your own censer. And in the morning, come with your censer and all your stuff lit up in your censer, smoke and all. And Aaron's going to stand here with his. Now imagine this picture. I just, I imagine it one day and I just laugh because it's such a picture of me. Here's 250 men with a motivation to stand before God themselves, to have a relationship with God themselves, and they're all standing there with their own censor. Everyone, 250 of them. That looks pretty impressive, I would think. All the smoke going, it looks rather, you know, valid because they're all 250 men standing there with their, with their uh, uh, censers and the smoke, and they're standing there in holy reverence to God because they know God's going to accept them. And here's one, one man standing here with his, the one validated of God, the one to whom that place and relationship belongs. And he stands there with his. Now look at the picture and think about 
I think about me. How many times have I stood there with my imaginary sensor thinking God accepts this, God validates this. That's all we want is validation from God. God, validate me. Here's his validation. And here's the, the signet of the proof of authenticity or validation or the ratifying of a covenant was found in the head of one man. Not in 250. One. And we know what happened. The earth comes, swallows them up. Well, that's not the end of the story. God continues. Well, man continues to rebel and God continues to drive home the fact one man's going to stand before me. He does the same thing. I mean, I think it's the next day or right after, not very long. Uh, it may say immediately after. I don't know how it's worded. Uh, they come out. Oh, well, after that, <laughs> uh, I shouldn't be laughing. This is not funny, but. All of Israel round about fled and cried them. They said, lest the earth swallow us up also. They're running from this picture of all of Korah and 250 men being swallowed up by the earth. And uh, this is verse 35 of number 16. And there came out a fire from the Lord, consumed 250 men that offered incense. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest. And he take up the censers out of the burning. This is <laughs> He takes every one of the censers. Of these 250 men are, are the ones that were left there that they could find. And he was to hammer them, censor of the sinners, the censors of these sinners against their own soul. Let them make them broad plates for a covering of the altar. For they offered them before the Lord. Therefore they are hallowed. They shall be a sign unto the children of Israel. And Eleazar took the brazen censer wherewith they that were burnt had offered. He took these censers and they were made broad plates for a covering of the altar to be a memorial unto the children of Israel. What was the memorial about? That no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, would come near to offer incense. That's what it was about. Only one seed can stand before me. That's what it was all about. Only one seed will stand before me. That's the judgment here. That has to happen here. Now, the next day, or shortly after that, they start griping again. They start complaining again. You killed the anointed of God. So a plague starts upon them. They all start dropping dead. And Moses and Aaron fall on their face first. And then Aaron grabs a censer and runs through the midst of the congregation. And you have the living over here that stand with Aaron. And you have the dead over here. What's he doing? He's making a division. He's showing a judgment. It says there, and he stood with his censer between the living and the dead. And the plague was stayed. But that doesn't stop. It doesn't stop there. God further makes his point. The next chapter. What does he do? <laughs> Take every one of them a rod. Now, just like these censers, I mean, just like these banners, they take 12 rods. And write the house of your fathers upon it. Write their name on it. And all the princes according to the house, twelve rods, write thou every man's name upon the rod. And you shall write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. Not Levi, Aaron. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom. And I will, <laughs> I love this. In the blossoming of this, this is what happens. And I will make to cease from me the murmuring and complaining of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. What ceases it? The blooming, the blossoming of the rod. He says that will cease their murmuring. That will cease their complaining. 
And Moses spake to the children of Israel, every one of them gave him a rod apiece for each prince one according to their father's house, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness, and it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi, Levi was budded, brought forth buds, and blossom blossoms, and yielded almonds. All of that in the span of one night, budded, blossomed, and yielded fruit. God's trying to push a pretty hard point here. And Moses brought out all the rods from, look at this, he brought all of them out. <laughs> Before the Lord unto all the children, he showed all the children of Israel these rods. And they looked and took every man his rod. And guess what they realized when they took their rod? Theirs wasn't the one that budded. Theirs wasn't the one that had almonds on it. Aaron's was. And that's what happens. Further, God's just driving it home. Driving the point. And what happens when this, he says, this will cease their murmuring from me. It does that. It ceases the murmuring in your soul when you see there's only one that lives here. That's what the budding was. It was about who lives, the resurrection. Who lives here in my house? Who lives here? The one that buds. And they saw when he handed them their empty stick, still with their name on it, nothing had happened to it. And they saw Aaron's that was budded. So now... The Lord said, Moses, bring Aaron's rod before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebellion. And thou shalt quiet, quiet take away their murmuring from me that they die not. Here's the thing. He brought it before the Lord and it quieted their murmuring. Why? It's in the seeing of the one who stands before the Lord as the only one who lives that will quiet that innate desire to rebel against reality, against the security of our soul. And what did they say? They finally just said, whosoever comes near unto the tabernacle shall die. We'll all be consumed dying here. That's fear. Now, that's the fear of the Lord. <laughs> I think that's the whole fear of the Lord. I can't come near this. I can't come, you know, it's kind of like the ark out 2,000 cubits. I can't come near that. It has to be apart from me to be real, to be true. It can't be defined with me near it or close to it. It has to be defined apart, separate from me. The holy of, what do you say about the high priest? Separate from sinners. So now, there's so much more, but then we get to another story, and this is about the king. It's amazing that the thing that we rebel against or have these rebellions against is priest and king in such a just a real, you know, graphic way because that is the inheritance of the firstborn. Let's take his inheritance. That's in here. That's, that's always there. Let's take what belongs to him. Let's take his place. And although Kay stole it, I'm going to try to... No, I'm just play. <laughs> so this is about Adonijah. And I've dealt with this a while back. Uh, and I don't have any time really to get into it. But uh, First Kings, I think I have it on here. Chapter 1. I, I would read first... Uh, 1 Chronicles 28, David says, all of, my, of all of my sons, God has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Then he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. And that's the declaration in, in 1 Chronicles 28. But let's go back here to 1 Kings chapter 1, and we see this story of Adonijah. First of all, you have David stricken in years, about to die, and they seek him out a wife. And uh, Abishag was the, was the one that they brought in, and, and she became his wife. She knew him not, it says, so 
they did not have sexual relations, but she still considered his wife. She nursed him through his last days and, uh, you know, heard, heard his heart and all of that. But after they do that, we're, we're faced with uh, his son here, David's son. In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, uh, 1 Kings. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, <clears throat> exalted himself. That's just as plain as you can get it. <laughs> he exalted himself. He had no authority to do it. He had no validation from the king. He did it himself. But look what he does to validate it. You can't just do it yourself. You've got to validate it somehow. <clears throat> That's what we all do. I mean, we do these things and we exalt ourselves in it. Even our humility becomes our self-exaltation. And we do things to back it up. To say this is, this is uh, ordained of God. He exalted himself saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots, horsemen, and 50 men to run before him. He has his entourage now. He's king. He's got his entourage. got chariots, got horses. He looks legit. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, why hast thou done so? Now this goes into other things. We won't get into that. <clears throat> Verse 7. And he conferred with Joab, the son of uh, Jeriah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. Now look what he had. He had the force of an army. He had the power. And he had a priest. He had his own theology to back up his exalting of himself. He had a priest to back him up. That's what the Adamic man, that natural instinct in us to do this very thing has. We have created our own theologies to back us up. To say, this is ordained of God for you to do and be in. But look, that's not what this picture is. The picture is one. The picture is one accepted, one beloved, one that stands before God. One who is the security of the whole. And now here's one rebellious soul saying, I will be. What, what was the one mistake he made? Well, he made a lot of them. But based upon his own motivation, his own because I'm talking about the Korah and the Adonijah that's in us. That's in all of us. That natural instinct and inclination to rebel against the very thing God has chosen and established. Because you'll see the very thing God established and chose was the very thing that, that, that uh, did away with Adonijah. At the end. But anyway, he, he, he does this, has his own theology. What was his, what was his deal? He never went to his father and heard his father's heart. He never waited to hear his father's view, his father's choice. He didn't wait to hear his father's declaration of who's king. Why? Because he didn't want to. People say, wait on the Lord. I don't want to. <laughs> I want to be. I want to do. And that's really what it is. And I'm not saying that as a slap to anybody. I'm saying that this is who I am naturally. This is me. This is in my heart. I want to be holy. I want to be righteous. I want to sit upon the throne before God accepted. So, he goes on. And he has all of this pomp and, and all of these people following. He gets a priest behind him, a theology to back it up. But it says here, Zadok the priest and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and Nathan the prophet and Shemiah and Ray and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with him. They didn't follow him. Why? They belonged to David. And there's so much, I'm out of time already, but Adonijah, listen, listen to this part. Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fatted calf. What did he do? Now, I know this is for a feast that he held with those, but what is that picture of? It's saying the cross is what validates what I'm doing. We do the same thing. What was the cross about? It was about making me holy. 
It's about making me righteous. It's about me. It's about this. It's about a better Adam. It's about Adam 2.0. Bigger and better. Spiritual. That's what we do. We say the cross is the validation of our rebellion against the singleness of God's view. That's what he did. But guess who he didn't call to this feast? Solomon. It's the same thing as in the garden. They hid themselves from the presence of God. He hid himself from Solomon. Because he knew. He knew. That it didn't really belong to him. Now, what did he do? He went according to a natural sequence of things. If it was a natural sequence of things, it really did belong to Adonijah. But God doesn't deal with natural things, natural sequences. He deals with his chosen one, his choice. Solomon was the choice. Solomon was the one that he, re- that he had chosen. So, they went, I have to, I have to hurry up here, but they went uh, finally to David. And this is Nathan uh, and Bathsheba. Bathsheba went first. Basically, Nathan told her, he said, here's what you need to do. You need to go into the king and tell him these things are happening. And trying to get to the place here. All right. Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty men of Solomon were not called to the feast. Wherefore, Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son... Now listen to this part. This, this is amazing to me. Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith does reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? Listen to those words. Here's a man that says, I'm the king... And David doesn't even know it. What did we talk about at the very beginning of this? It's all come down to this. The Lord knoweth those that are his. David didn't even know this. What's the word know? It doesn't just mean he was, he understood it. It, it, it goes, it, it's far beyond that. It's 3045 in the Hebrew and Strong's. Yada. And it means to know, to consider, to be aware of, to give regard to. To acknowledge in any way, to be acquainted with, to entertain, or to recognize. He doesn't even recognize this. Vine says, in addition to the cognitive uh, part of it presented, this verb has a purely experiential side. The knower in this case has actual involvement in the object known. In other words, David's not even involved in what Adonijah is doing. He doesn't have any idea. He's not involved. He doesn't entertain it, respect it. He's not participating in it in any way. And I thought, how many things have we done, have I done, that I thought God had validated, and he doesn't even know it? He doesn't even involve himself in it. He's not even involved there. And there's so much more to the story here, and, and I'm out of time. Uh, finally David understood though what, what the answer was Bathsheba, Nathan they all went to him and he understood what was the answer to this dilemma what's the answer to a man in rebellion I have to reveal who the true king is I have to make known who the true king upon the throne is and so he did he declares it and he says not only that blow trumpets in Israel or in Jerusalem and blow them and say Solomon is the king now uh, and then it comes God there's so much then it comes to a point where uh, after Solomon is declared to be the king by David Adonijah finds out And he runs for his life, but he runs to the altar and he grabs hold of the altar. And and finally, uh, basically he gets forgiven. And Solomon says, go to your house and do not cause any more trouble here. 
Now look at what happened. This is after he's declared, revealed to be king. In fact, I love, I am going to share this for a second. Uh, in verse 20 of, uh, first, uh, of the first chapter of First Kings, Bathsheba comes to him and says this, O king, the eyes of all of Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell who shall sit upon the throne. Who's the rightful king? All of Israel's eye is upon you. That's the posture. That's the perfect posture. But the word tell there is 5046 in the Strongs. And it means to make known or to publish. In Vines it says it's to explain or reveal something to someone who does not and cannot otherwise know. All of Israel is dependent here. Their eyes are upon you, David, for you to reveal Solomon. You see that picture? Unless you reveal Solomon, they're going to be tricked into believing this guy's king. They're going to be tricked and they're going to be under the assumption, the false assumption, this man has the authority. This man has the place. Until you reveal Solomon, all of Israel's eyes are upon you so you'll tell them what they can't know otherwise. I love that. So after he does declare him, Adonijah finally gets forgiven, he, you know, and all of that goes back to his house. And then he tries again because it's always there in the heart of man. Continual, nonstop, wanting the place that doesn't belong to me, wanting the place that belongs to another. So he goes to Bathsheba, of all people, just the arrogance of this guy, and he says, you know the kingdom was mine. It belongs to me. Yeah, God said that, but it belonged to me. And all the people were behind me. God, I'd go back to, but Bathsheba tells, Bathsheba tells David when she's telling him about he needs to reveal who the true king is. She says this. She says, unless you do this, when you die, Solomon and I will be seen as the one in offense. We'll be seen as the one in the wrong here. We'll be seen as sinners is basically one, one thing it says. To miss the mark. In other words, and that's what happens. When Christ is not revealed in our hearts, evil is called good, good is called evil. The very thing that is reality and that secures our soul is the very thing we think is an offense to the truth. People think this singularity, the exclusivity I'm talking about today is an offense. Why? Because Solomon has not yet been revealed. Now, that's just a side, but he goes to Bathsheba and he says, go in and ask him if he'll give me Abishag to be my wife. Now, remember, we talked about her when Abishag's her name. Talked about her. She was David's wife, the one that kept him during the time he was dying. And, and Solomon went irate. Now, I, there's so many pieces of this that I can't deal with because I'm already well over my hour, but... Uh, he goes and he asks and Solomon gets irate and he says why don't you just ask me for the kingdom basically that's what he was asking for because to get the wife of the former king meant you were king that's why Absalom took the concubines of David Absalom did the same thing because to have the wives of the king means you're the one you're the next king so he's still asking for the kingdom. He's just doing it in the most roundabout, evil, vindictive way as possible. And when she goes to Solomon, he says, I tell you what, he's just sealed his fate. The only answer for Adonijah now, the only answer that's ever been for Adonijah wasn't just forgiveness, it was death. This man had to die. I can't forgive him. I have to kill him. Now this dying of Adonijah doesn't take place before. It takes place after the king is revealed. Has to. Can't take before because the king cannot execute the judgment until he's revealed. But look who he sends. And I'll stop here. Uh, there's so much and I, I, I apologize for uh, jumping around so much. And, but he goes, he sends... Here's 
somewhere. Anyway, he tells two guys, one is Benaiah and one is another name, and I can't even find the verse. King Solomon sent by the hand, yeah, here it is. And King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. He sent one guy, I'm sorry, and it says he's the son of Jehoiada. But he sent Benaiah. What does the word there mean? It's It's beautiful. When you look at it, because the word there, Jehoiada means what God has established. And Benaiah means known of God. So what is the end of Adonijah? What probably brings him to his end? What God has established and what is known of God. That's what kills Adonijah. That's what brings him to his end. That's what happens with us. The one who wants to have the place that belongs to another, the only answer for him is for that which God has established, the one whom God knows to be revealed. And guess what it does? It does the same thing that happened with the rods. It quiets the murmur. It ceases the complaint in my heart. Because I finally see, dear God, there was no security as long as I was wanting to be anything. The only security is the fact that he is everything and I'm nothing. The only one that God looks at and says, this is my beloved one, lives in me. What more can I want? What more is there? So what is the need? What is the need in us? What is the thing that's demanded of us in this state? To wait on the revealing of the king. And then the other takes place. The other happens. The other t- I mean, I, was, I had uh, Psalms 2 to go into where it says, Why did the heathen, heathen rage and vain, uh, imagine a vain thing? And they, they uh, tumult with themselves and they converse and they try to plot against me. He says, but I laugh at that. Have you ever heard God laugh at you? (laughs) You're so stupid. Why? Because everything I have thought, everything I have imagined in my vain imagination doesn't touch what God's already established. Why? Because he says, I've set my king in my holy hill. What can their vain imaginations and their raging against me do? I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And I have said to him the oath, the same oath we talked about earlier. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This day have I begotten thee. This day have I begotten. That's the... That's the security of the thing. And no matter how much in my heart we try to rebel, the fact is God's already set his king on his hill. He set his king on his throne. He has established what he's established. And nothing we try or attempt to do will ever touch what God's already done. What God's already made a fact. What God's already made reality. The need for our soul is to wait in patience. To set our hearts Upon the knowing and seeing of the one chosen. That's the need. Seeing the one God has chosen. The one God has set on his throne. The one that God sees in the holy of holies. That he may be revealed in us and be in us the anchor. The very thing that secures us in reality. I apologize for taking so long. And... uh, for jumping around a lot. Um, but I, I poorly, I tried to uh, at least drive home, do, basically do what Jimmy was saying, to refocus us on the thing that God has focused on, to 
to refocus us on the singleness of God's view. How God has brought all things of His relationship to man itself into the person of His Son. That there is no other relationship God has but that one. So may that Son with whom He has His relationship be revealed in our hearts and be the only desire we possess to, to know Him. To me, it's not about trying to cultivate. It used to be trying to cultivate my relationship with God through fasting and prayer and Bible study. Now it is, Father, reveal your Son in me in a greater, clearer, more perfect way that I may know my relationship with you and live in the good of that. So we'll stop there. Amen. Thanks for being with us, everyone.